This is the sermon for the fifth Sunday after Pentecost. This morning we are reading from Matthew's Gospel, the 13th chapter, beginning with the first verse. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. He told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, in another thirty. This morning we are looking at a parable. Now, if you have spent any time in the Christian church, chances are these parables are at least somewhat familiar to you. In much the same way, you have probably heard somewhere from someone that the definition of a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Some years ago, when my sister and I were both a lot younger, we went to different high schools. I went to a public high school that was geared towards, shall we say, the terminally nerdy, and she went to Catholic school. Of course, in Catholic school, one takes religion class. I remember her coming home from school one day, telling me that she had learned about parables. I also remember being at least a little bit surprised that the definition she got of a parable, the one I just mentioned, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, was identical to the one I had heard from my confirmation pastor in the Lutheran church. It seemed that at least so far as parables were concerned, we were pretty much all on the same page. Now, if in fact that definition is accurate, then it seems that all that is left to us to figure out is the heavenly or spiritual point of the parable, and then we might say we have done our work. And of course, in this particular instance, Jesus actually explains the parable, so it seems like our work is already done. But this morning, I would like to suggest that as we often discover, all is not quite as it immediately appears. While we may be inclined to believe that Jesus taught in parables because they are concise, even pithy stories with readily recognizable common elements that can be easily remembered and internalized by people without any special knowledge or training, that, in fact, may not be quite the case. If we were to look at the part of the text that the Revised Common Lectionary leaves out, we would read these potentially disturbing words of our Lord, beginning with verse 10. Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven but to them it has not been given. 
For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. Uh, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. These words may make us uncomfortable, especially if what we take from them is that Jesus is somehow being mean. You people, my disciples, get to know something special, but I'm not telling them because I don't like them. I believe, however, that what is indicated here is not that Jesus is somehow withholding vital information out of some sort of divine anger or simply capriciousness, but rather that Jesus is stating a point of reality. Given the spiritually dead hearts and spiritually clogged ears of the people, they will have no ability to understand what is being said neither in parables nor plainly. That much may be easy to understand when we consider the history of the church with all its internal feuds and its external holy wars, its bloody coups and tacit or at times not so tacit encouragement of warfare. It seems that in the dullness of our hearts we have somehow in very large part managed to confuse the Prince of Peace with the God of War. You will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed. What's interesting about this is the fact that the disciples were no better off, really, than anyone else. They themselves would most likely not have understood the parable unless Jesus was there to explain it to them. And so it is today as well. In order to understand the teachings of Jesus, it seems we must have the Spirit of Jesus enabling us to look at those teachings through what I call a Christ lens. So now you might ask, what is this Christ lens? And while there might be many plausible answers to the question, the simplest and probably most meaningful is that the Christ lens is the lens of compassion, much as the Spirit of Christ is the Spirit of compassion. Having said that, I'd like to go on to suggest that as we first come to this parable, and maybe each time we come to it anew, at the first, the parable is not so much something we read hoping to get the point, but something that reads us, something that points out who we are and how we think and feel. In short, what we make of the parable really tells us all about us. Now, when we read this story, and we hear about the different kinds of ground, and then we hear Jesus' concise explanation for the metaphor, there are generally two ways, I think, that our minds are wont to go. Either we will look inward and wonder, what sort of ground am I? Am I the rocky ground, or the shallow ground, or the ground choked out by thorns? Am I the dirt of the path? Is my yard full of crows eating my life-giving seeds? I couldn't possibly be the good, rich soil, could I? I certainly don't feel all that good or rich. While on the other hand, I do often feel kind of stepped on, and rocky, and beset by thorns. In short, we might worry. 
Am I good enough for God? Am I good enough for my family and loved ones? Am I really getting it? And what happens if I don't? Will I go to hell? Or to purgatory? Or will I simply just live a delusional life until I succumb to some sort of spiritual disaster? And that's certainly one way of looking at it. Or if we perchance consider ourselves to be the rich soil, or at least a little richer than the rest of the soil around us, we may be tempted to use the states described in this parable as a way to measure others. Oh, look at him. He's obviously one on the path. Look how quickly the cares of this world obliterate the word of God in his life. Ah, clearly she is the rocky soil. Look at the way the word once sprung up in her life and how quickly she lost her faith. And so we use the words of Jesus to judge others. But neither way of looking at this story and its explanation is particularly compassionate. In the first, we lack compassion towards ourselves. And the second, we evidence no compassion to others. So what might the Christ lens, the lens of compassion, actually be? Two thoughts come to mind. The first is that in order to be true to ourselves and others, just experientially, we must recognize that we are, all of us, most frequently, every part of the story. We are the rocky ground whose flowering is quickly scorched by the sun. We are the ground filled with thorns and thistles, the cares of life so soon choking out our joy. We are the ground of the path where cares, like so many black carrion birds, eat away at the joy of salvation. And then, yes, there are those glorious moments when we are also the rich soil. If that were not true, we would not even so much as seek the wisdom of Christ. We are all these things, and by God's grace, we are in the process of being made more and more into the likeness of what he would have us be. With each act of forgiveness, with each kind word, with each selfless deed, we become all the more that good, rich, life-giving soil. But there is another thought, the second thought I had, and I believe it to be more important than even the last one. We must remind ourselves that the Gospels are about Jesus rather than about us. This parable, I believe, is not so much about the soil, but about the one who spreads the seeds. And it seems that, unlike any sensible, real-world farmer, the sower of seeds in this story does so indiscriminately and lavishly. Jesus is spreading seeds all over the place. It seems he doesn't care if the soil is rocky or thorny or along the path. He keeps throwing those seeds down in divine hope. Imagine Jesus, the ultimate optimist. I believe that Jesus and his Father, who is your Father and my Father, know that we all have our rocky moments and our downtrodden, bird-eaten moments. But he keeps spreading the soil of abundant life, knowing that because we are made in his image, we also have our moments of rich and ready receptiveness. When his word, his grace, will spring up and take root. Just one final thought. I mentioned briefly that we look at parables we might want to consider that at one time or another, we are potentially all the parts of the story. If we take seriously the notion that we're the body of Christ, then perhaps we too are called not just to be soil, 
let alone soil that is preoccupied and worried about whether or not we or the next person is good enough. We are, in reality, also the sower. We are called to walk in the example of Jesus, to sow seeds of love and compassion indiscriminately, regardless of whether it seems to us those seeds will take root or not. We are called to bring good news, to foster the abundant life wherever and whenever we encounter God's beloved children who, like us, are sometimes beset by thorns and sometimes scorched by this world's fiery sun, but also because they are made in his image, destined to ultimately be rich enough to receive his love. <laughs>